What do you think of when you hear the words Jamaica and Olympics? Inevitably, most people will immediately think of the incredible number of track and field champions this island nation has produced over the years. However, did you know that Jamaica has also fielded a team at every Winter Olympics since 1988? In today's episode, I'm going to share the incredible story of Benjamin Alexander, a former financial professional and international DJ who was first exposed to alpine skiing at the age of 32. Benjamin joins us from his training center in Austria as he is now just two months away from making history and becoming the first alpine skier from Jamaica to compete in the Winter Olympics. There are so many exciting storylines heading into Beijing 2022, and I'm super excited to bring everybody the story of Benjamin Alexander and the Jamaican ski team. Welcome to episode 17 of Real Talk China. All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome into the studio today, Benjamin Alexander. And everyone, this is going to be an amazing show that we have today because Benjamin is attempting to become the first alpine skier representing the country of Jamaica in the Winter Olympics. Benjamin, how are you today? Absolutely fantastic. Just noticing that I got a bit of a tan line from uh, my goggles today on the camera here. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I'm so excited to tell your story, and this is just so fascinating. So I'm, I'm really excited. You know, I love the Winter Olympics. I love the Olympics in general, and and it's just so exciting to see China being able to host these Olympics next February. And I want to talk about your journey because this is truly one of the best stories. And I think that's what's that's what's so exciting about the Olympics. There's always some amazing storylines coming in. And Benjamin, you've got one of the most interesting ones. So I want to talk, I want to get everybody to know your whole story though, because you, uh, you know, many skiers begin at a very young age. Uh, you, however, have not. Tell us first about your, your first career, because you've had a very successful career that wasn't skiing. Tell us about that and how this opened your opportunity to start traveling around the world. Yeah, well, you're referring to my DJ career, but actually uh, I worked in finance for quite some time before becoming a DJ. Okay. So I did the cardinal sin of giving up your day job uh, to become yeah. a full-time DJ in 2000 and end of 2009, 2010, and it was quite successful. So yeah, basically for the last decade, uh, I've been an international DJ performing across five continents, across uh, playing in over 30 countries around the world, and just had a ball of a time getting to share my music with, with the planet. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, and and so that would have been you started in 2009. So I mean, this was I'm, I'm assuming that you would have definitely been to China then uh, during that scene. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't believe the club exists anymore. But uh, there was a club called Drop in Jintandi in Shanghai, which was fantastic. Okay, uh, which was kind of like a branch of its uh, Hong Kong older brother, shall we say. Okay. Um, and I had a lot of fun in Shanghai. Oh, nice. Fantastic. Well, Shanghai is the city that I lived in for seven years in China. It is, uh, you know, truly one of the best cities in the world, I feel. And I'm so glad. And, and then you were also uh, based in, in Hong Kong for several years, correct? Yeah, I lived in Hong Kong for four years after spending four years in Thailand. Um, and actually, Hong Kong was where I picked up an old hobby that was just a hobby previously and turned that into the profession of DJing at a club called Volar on Lang Kwai Fong that was around for the better part of 12 years, I think. Uh, it just it just shut during the pandemic, unfortunately. Okay, okay. So you've had a lot of experience in China and obviously been traveling around the world. I want to know, uh, Benjamin, what was your first impressions? You know, you were living in Hong Kong, but what was your impressions when you went to a city like Shanghai and, and seeing how fast uh, China was growing? Uh, I think you used the, uh, the key word there, fast. First impressions was the maglev train at 380 plus kilometers an hour into the city. Uh, that was incredible. And, and then just realizing how quickly that city had sprouted out of, you know, very, very humble beginnings. There are these incredible photos online when you can look at Shanghai in the 70s or 80s and now look at it now. And yes. they're just two completely different things with all the skyscrapers. So I think the first time I went to uh, Shanghai would have been for the Formula One in 2007. And I remember staying in the Marriott on the people, uh, the, the Meridian on uh, People's Square. And you have these two incredible buildings. I forget the name of the hotel that was opposing it, but they look like transformer robots, like facing off with one another. And I think, I think what a lot of people don't understand that live in the West is how futuristic cities like Hong Kong and Shanghai are. And honestly, they, they, they really put a lot of places in the West to shame for how, how strong their infrastructure is and just 
how fast things are moving, the pace at which things are growing and expanding. Um, and I just had my first experience of, of Shenzhen and similarly was just blown away by this, uh, the Silicon Valley of the East, as they call it, but incredible. Yeah, it, I'm so glad that you've had those experiences. And, you know, it's interesting being an expat in China for many years, you know, we're used to seeing things at China speed. And, and, and like you said, yeah. I mean, it just happens so incredibly fast. Um, you know, how fast the country has been evolving, um, you know, and, and just building these infrastructure projects. It really is a model for the world and, and quite, quite amazing. So it's great that you've been able to experience that. And I want to jump right into, you know, your story here, because you, you have an amazing story here. And I want to take us back to the beginning because you, you were in finance, you had a successful career. You then parlayed that into a passion, which was DJing. And you had another fantastic career in there. You know, what got you interested to become an alpine skier? Actually, that was as the result of my DJing. So in 2015, okay. I was invited to DJ as part of a ski trip. And I just, it was my first experience of being right up and close with my friends who were skiing. I wasn't skiing, but yeah. it was my first like experience right there, seeing my friends do this incredible thing that pre previous to that, I'd just kind of written off as being a sport that I wasn't that interested in. As you said, uh, most skiers start at a much younger age. Uh, right. I was 30, 32 when, when I first saw people doing this thing. Um, and, it, you know, right there and then I just made a decision. I want to do this. There were no uh, delusions Amazing. of grandeur. There was no expectation of going to the Olympics. It just looked like a fun sport that I wanted to be a part of. And, and where was that experience, your first skiing experience? In uh, British Columbia, Canada. Okay. Is it, was it at Whistler? Uh, no, it was actually a heli ski lodge. <laughs> oh, heli ski lodge. Okay, nice. Well, I'm I'm actually in Vancouver right now, so you know, uh, here, right here in British Columbia, Canada. So that's uh, that's awesome because uh, actually, just last year, now I grew up in Florida, and and I grew up water skiing, and just last year for the first mm -hmm. time, I, I went snow skiing, and I had a similar experience. I said, "Wow, this is amazing!" amazing. And you know, li living here in British Columbia, I mean, you have to take advantage of that. We have some amazing uh, yep. world class ski slopes here. Obviously, Whistler being the most notable one. Uh, so, so you started. So, thirty-two is your first exposure to skiing, and and what what you had? What when did this idea come in your mind, saying, "I want to take this to the next level"? You know, I want to I want to represent Jamaica, and and I think and as well, I think it's important for our guests to know um, your accent. You you know, you're originally or you grew up in England. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, yep. And then your your family your family has roots back to Jamaica. So tell us a little bit about this idea to represent Jamaica, and then the, the grand idea to say I want to be an Olympian. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I I never like to do things by half measure, and okay. so when I caught the skiing bug, my first time actually skiing after ex experiencing it at the Heli Ski Lodge was in Whistler, yeah. um, and in February of 2016, and so I went down the rabbit hole pretty fast, and so. A couple of years after beginning, I was skiing again in Canada for a week, then in Japan for a week, then in Patagonia, both sides, Chile and Argentina, and I really caught the bug. Um, I also went to the Olympics as a spectator for the first time in 2018 in Pyeongchang. And one of the things struck me was that, yeah, one of the things that struck me was that there were only three Jamaican athletes. Now, Jamaica is a powerhouse in the summer games, and I would have thought that there would be many other people that would be following in the footsteps of that heroic 1988 Jamaican bobsled team, which the movie was made about cool runnings, and would have tried right. their hand, yeah, at, at, uh, at winter sports. So, you know, the, the kernel or a seed of an idea was formed then. Um, 2018 was also the year that I decided that I was going to retire from DJing and, and search for the next passion in life. And so the first thing I decided to do was to go to back to Canada and spend a month again in British Columbia, but at Revelstoke, just okay. to see whether or not you know, uh, you know, if I could do something serious with skiing. The reason this whole thing came about is because as a mixed race person, you always kind of represent the minority of the group that you are in at any given moment, right? So that can change from second to second by walking to different rooms. Interesting. Skiing yeah. being the yeah, predominantly white sport, um, I, I, I'm the black representative of my group. And so people would always make these references to Cool Runnings, to the Jamaican bobsled team. And I thought to myself, why not? Let's just give it a try. So in 2019 in Revelstoke, Canada, I had the opportunity to ski with a former international skier, a uh, Europa Cup skier. And I said to him, uh, look, I have this crazy idea of going to the Olympics for Jamaica. I have no idea what that means, what that entails, or even if it's possible. But I'd like you to just look at my skiing and see what you think. He said, okay, let's go. We Amazing. skied for the, for the morning. And at lunchtime, he said, 
okay, I'll be honest, your skiing technique, absolutely atrocious, terrible. But you've told me you've only been skiing for 25 days. Of course, it's going to be atrocious and terrible. Right. He said, but what I can't understand is how, you know, you've only been skiing for 25 days. I've skied my entire life. I'm a retired Europa Cup skier. I have no idea how you're keeping up with me. You're completely fearless. He says, come to think about it. I think you have more than half the battle won because if you're afraid, we can never teach you to be a racer. But if you're, mm. uh, if you're fearless, then we can teach you the technique. And that began this journey. He helped me understand what a slalom was and a giant slalom and the differences between them. Up until that point, I had no idea. Uh, English people don't grow up watching ski racing. Uh, it's just not a thing. And so that was the beginning of this uh, crazy story. Oh, that's incredible. What a story. And and you definitely take me as a person that when, when you find a passion in life, you, you go all in on it. And, and it seems, yeah. you know, you're very intelligent, very well spoken. And it just seems you, you have a good head on your shoulders. I, I can just see you as the person that once you get that initiative and you said, OK, I'm going to do this. You're all in. You're, you're all yeah. in on, on, on everything. I, I, I can see that in your personality. That's that's fan, fascinating. So so what what is it? How do, how do you qualify for the Olympics now? I mean, because you haven't had that professional experience. I know, for example, uh, here in Canada, for example, to be an alpine skier is extremely competitive. And just to be able to qualify for the Canadian uh, national team and to represent Canada at the Olympics uh, would be a very difficult task. You know, these these athletes are starting. Um, I'm actually going to have a couple uh, alpine skiers um, on my on my channel. Uh, I'm on the 50 day anniversary the 50 day countdown to Beijing 2022 I'm going to have several Canadian athletes coming in I think one a couple of them are as young as 16 so I know they've been training you know for uh, you know for as soon as they could probably walk so how about yourself I mean you're in your mid 30s you you have this very big goal and you have the passion to do it what what does it take how do you get qualified for Beijing 2022 yeah so one of the really interesting things about this story is you're absolutely right if I was trying to compete for Canada or Austria or any of the powerhouse nations, forget about it. A guy that begins skiing at 32 instead of two and begins yeah. uh, racing at 37 instead of seven, no chance. You're not going to, it's incredibly challenging to, to qualify for the Canadian team. You'll never, right. I'm never going to get there. But what the uh, International Olympic Committee want is they want to have diversity and as many nations, as many nationalities represented in as many different disciplines as possible. But what they do to facilitate that is they allow every country to put forward one athlete at the B standard. Now, the B standard is someone that demonstrates a level of professionalism and competence in the sport. They're not going to kill themselves on, on TV in, th- in front of a million eyeballs, right. but they're also unlikely to, to meddle. And the hope is that that person then kind of blazes a pathway that the following generations of people from that country can see that it's possible. And then people from that country start to get into that sport at a younger age. And a generation later, maybe Jamaica has a bunch of pretty decent skiers. You know, case in point, after those after those guys did what they did in 1988, the Jamaican bobsled team, we have had a bobsled uh, team at nearly every Olympic since, and that's carried oh, on. Yeah. That's um, fantastic. So that's that's what that's what l- allows this to happen. Oh, that's fantastic! And again, that that goes back to how I open this this interview up is saying, you know, these there's always some great storylines here, and I think that this is what's so incredible about sport because it has the ability to, you know, bring countries together from around the world, and that, that's what we really need. I mean, I was I was so inspired by the Tokyo 2020 Olympics that were held last year or this year rather in 2021. You know, because, you know, this is what the world needed. You know, we've all been through a lot over the last couple of years with the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, you see these amazing, these inspirational stories. And I think it's going to be incredible, you know, for for the for Jamaica and for your family as well. Now, I've got a, a, a more of a personal question for you. You know, your father was born and, and raised in, in Jamaica. And, yep. in, and, you know, what would this mean? What does it mean to, to him personally, uh, you know, his family, you know, your, your family that, you know, that has these roots to Jamaica? What, what is it? Tell me what your father thinks about this. And what, what yeah, his so, thoughts are. So my father actually moved to England right before his fifth birthday. So he's, okay. he's almost, uh, you know, almost fully British, fully English. But right. what's right. really interesting is uh, Jamaicans are incredibly proud of their Olympic success. I, yes. I would say that second to Bob Marley, it is the thing that Jamaicans are the most proud about. So when I was, uh, I spent three months there last year when I couldn't access snow because of the pandemic. And I can tell you that people were incredibly warm and receptive to the idea and super excited for the country to have an athlete in a in a new sport and what that could mean for the long run of the, of the country's uh, successes in the Olympics. 
Absolutely. Well, there's all, there's obviously some really great memories, um, you know, for Jamaican athletes in Beijing. I mean, obviously, 2008, uh, Usain yeah. Bolt, uh, you know, that was really his his uh, coming out party was in 2008, yeah. where he just had an unbelievable performance. I was in Beijing for 2008 well, uh, Summer Olympics, and it was just so incredible because he was the biggest storyline, I think, along with Michael Phelps from America. But uh, I mean, that the 100 meter, that's the premier event of of the, yep. uh, you know, of the Summer Olympics. And it, it's amazing because I think I also, I think, you know, uh, Jamaica has been building, uh, uh, um, you know, more presence in the Winter Olympics. I think if I remember hearing this correctly, I believe they might be assembling the largest delegation in history that is going to travel to Beijing in 2022. Can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Just quickly going back to the 2008 games, I can remember yeah. very clearly being at the Bangkok airport on my way to uh, on to on my way to Hong Kong and just watching that opening ceremony on the TVs oh, at the, the airport. Absolutely incredible, and it just really just goes to show the power uh, of of large large numbers of people. And this is the, the thing that China is so good at. Like uh, I remember specifically the uh, the the light show that they did, and everyone was holding just one light, almost like a pixel as part of a matrix, and creating these incredible performances. Um, but yeah, Jamaican delegation. So we have the the bobsleigh team that are currently just arrived in Park City, trying to qualify. We have the women, okay. the two women bobsled, also trying to qualify, and we have the women skeleton. So that's going to be uh, seven athletes plus myself will make eight. Uh, which okay. is going to be the largest largest delegation. We we have a couple of ice skaters who can't officially oh, nice. yeah they they they're they're based out of Miami, um, but they can't officially qualify because Jamaica doesn't have an ice skating rink. So we're trying to get the rules changed or to get an exception for them because they are of of the the skill level to be able to get there. Um, and actually, in Canada there is a Jamaican hockey team. They haven't qualified for the games, but hopefully in in, in the next for the next games maybe in Italy we'll have the Jamaican uh, hockey team, which would definitely be the biggest delegation. But yeah, eight of us going this uh, this coming games will be the biggest so far. And when we get the ice skaters and when we get the hockey team uh, qualified, it's just going to explode from there. Oh, that's that's amazing. And, you know, it's interesting. It might be interesting for the viewers to hear this. You know, when you say the ice skating, um, you know, uh, Jamaican team is is in Miami, then you've got the hockey yeah. team in Canada. Uh, one of the thing and this is, I think, when we're looking at the bigger picture, obviously, uh, Jamaica is a very warm climate. You know, you're not going to have a place there for winter sports, uh, you know, directly. However, there's 2 million Jamaicans that live around the world. So, you know, this is where I think is so important, you know, stories like yourself and, you know, again, growing the sport, you know, again, the Olympics obviously wanting to get the most amount of athletes there. And and I know, for example, there's a tremendous Jamaican population um, in Toronto. Toronto, Canada has a lot of a lot of people originally yeah. from Jamaica. And and I know that, you know, many Jamaicans very proud of their their heritage and even if they're in another country abroad. So that also just another good story, you know, as we continue to see the sport evolving and growing. Yeah, absolutely. So there's actually 80,000 Jamaicans in Toronto. So there's quite a big presence of them there. Um, and you're right. Yeah. So 2 million in the diaspora. Those 2 million are just Canada, UK and the United States. There's a big there's a big uh, chunk of Jamaicans in, in Japan, in Australia, New Zealand. Like, we're all over the place. But the interesting thing is, yeah, the interesting thing is 2 million in the diaspora, but uh, 2.7 million on the island. So almost 40% of all Jamaicans have access or will have easier access to winter sports than you would in initially believe when you thought about this small Caribbean island um, with beaches and, and sun sea and, and cocktails. So, yeah. That is that is fascinating. That is that is so that is so incredible. Uh, Benjamin, I want to talk a little bit more specifically about your training. Um, because I, I, I know that um, you've dedicated yourself to this goal. Tell us a little bit more about the logistics of this. Like, for example, where have you been based and, you know, and, you know, basically doing your day to day training over these last couple of years as, as you, you have been preparing for these Winter Olympics? Yeah. So I grew up in a small town of 50,000 people. And as most people that grew up in small towns feel, they try their hardest to run towards the big cities. Um, I've spent the majority of the last two years in towns as small, if not smaller than my hometown. Um, mostly my time has been in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, where I was where I spent most of my time. And now I've spent coming up on four months of this year in a tiny mountain town in Austria. 
And so, you know, we're, we're just trying to get as much time as possible on snow, as much time as possible racing gates and, and working with the coaches to, to tweak and modify all of my technique to help me be faster. No, fantastic. Fantastic. And what, what does a typical day look like in, in your life as, as, a, as an Olympian and, and as someone training for the Olympics? I mean, how, how much of it is spent, uh, for example, uh, training in, in the gym? You know, I'm sure you're having to do a lot of cardio sessions, probably weight training, um, you know, a lot of, I'm, I'm assuming, stretching, flexibility exercises. So, um, you know, super early start, 6 a.m. Um, we always try to be the first on the mountain nine times out of 10, the best snow conditions or 99 times out of 100, the best snow conditions are first thing in the morning. So we want to be on there for the for the for the first chair. We will typically do a few runs to kind of just warm ourselves up to limber up. Um, and then we'll get right into the race course. We'll be there with video. Uh, we'll have the iPad out there to look back at the video to critique things. We'll have timed runs to understand perhaps we're losing time in one section as opposed to the other section. It's incredibly technical. And what's interesting is it's so demanding on the body that you might only do 10 runs in the course. And each of these runs is only about a minute. And then you're, you're beat. You know, you give it your all for every corner because what a lot of people that have tried leisure skiing don't understand is that the conditions that we're skiing on are typically incredibly icy. So to get the skis to actually grip and to kind of bounce and make these turns just requires every ounce of strength and power that you have. Um, so that would be like a normal training day. We tend not to be in the gym on the same days that we're training on the slope. We, you, you, know, you need to let the muscles rest and relax so that we'll have gym days where we're working on strength and core and conditioning. Fortunately, um, my sport doesn't require too much cardio because it's just this one minute burst down. It's more about explosive strength than it is about cardio. Um, gotcha. And then completely polar to my, my DJ life, I struggle to stay awake past 10 p.m. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would imagine that you need as much. I mean, sleep is such a huge element as a sportsman. I mean, you need to have that recovery. You need to be, you know, optimizing everything. So I'm sure it's uh, changed your entire lifestyle. You know, I'm sure you're as a DJ, you're probably not going to bed till 4 a.m. And as a DJ, probably waking up at 10 p.m. to get into the club at one o'clock, to get out of the club at six o'clock, and then maybe play another party until the early hours of the afternoon, and maybe getting to sleep before the oh, sun wow. goes down. So a complete flip. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, I was totally wrong on that. That's, 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 <laughs> that's fascinating. Um, how about your diet? I want to, I want to know, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a world-class skier, you know, what would your diet consist of? Uh, so I'm on the seafood diet right now. Okay. Which means anything I eat, anything I see, I eat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, I like that. Really, so, so one of the things that's really important about, um, about downhill alpine skiing is you're using gravity as your main propulsion, right? It's mm -hmm. all about gravity. Yeah. So if any any mass that you can pack on, of course, preferably muscle mass as opposed to just being a flubby guy. But if right. you look at some of the really, really successful skiers, they're big, broad, and stocky, low center of gravity. I'm super tall, yeah. unfortunately. But low right. center of gravity and a lot of mass just to help them get this uh, advantage going down the hill. That makes complete sense. Oh, that's interesting. So you're on the seafood diet. You're trying to, you're, I'm assuming, because you look like a very tall and lean guy. I'm assuming you're trying to put on as much muscle and, and uh, weight as exactly. you can, like you said, to, to get yep. that gravity to help you. Um, Benjamin, a couple last questions here. Um, you know, Beijing is set to make history uh, when it becomes the first city in the world to host both a summer and winter Olympics. Um, what, what is, what is, what are you most looking forward to, to, you know, to going to Beijing? What are you looking forward to seeing? What are you looking to forward to experiencing while you're there? Yeah. Well, look, if it was a normal year, I would be super excited to get out to the great wall of China and some of the beautiful gardens that are in the city that I've heard about. Mm. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I believe that we're going to have quite a, a muted experience, meaning that we'll arrive and we'll be put initially, uh, immediately into an athlete bubble. Right. Uh, we'll only be able to interact with other athletes. And I, I don't believe that we'll, we were even allowed to go into the city to have a look around. Um, right. I've flown through Beijing quite a few times with uh, okay. some of the airlines that you guys have, have hubbed out of there, but I've never explored the city. So it's a shame that I won't get the opportunity to. But right. I'm super excited uh, about what this means for the world. China has uh, a pledge to try to get 300 million people into winter sports. I tried to do a bit of calculating the other day to figure out how many people probably ski in the world right now. And it's mm -hmm. definitely less than that number. China has the potential to double the number of people that are interested in skiing. 
And I think that's just good news for everyone. Yeah, and I think I want to highlight that you brought up a really good point, and and this is something uh, you know I've spent a lot of time in Beijing over the years, and you know of course the city of Beijing um, is going to have some of the uh, um, you know for example the indoor winter sports are going to be more, more located in the center city. However, yeah. you know obviously these big runs you know where you're doing the alpine skiing is going to be on the outskirts, and this has also had a tremendous financial impact on these small cities, and and, and as they're building these ski resorts and. I remember uh, being here in Whistler, Canada, for example. I remember seeing a Chinese uh, ski delegation, you know, coming over to Whistler, and this was actually the, you know, the basically the Ministry of Sport from China. They said, you know, we want to come to Whistler and we want to see what these what a world class mountain looks like. Now, the mountain won't be the same, but what's really great about Whistler is the Whistler Village and the amenities and and basically how do you set this up? How do you run a ski? Resort, you know, you need the hotel, you need the restaurants, you need all the logistics set up. So they had sent, you know, the Ministry of Sport had sent this ski delegation here to basically try to learn and try to see, you know, what are some of these Western countries doing? And I think that's what I I, I remember seeing a lot of interviews with some local Chinese saying, look, you know, we're going to be hosting the Winter Olympics in six, seven years from now. And, you know, they were so excited because this was a whole new industry. You know, like you think about um, and, and we've seen this actually with a lot of sport, for example, um, football or soccer, as we say in North America, uh, basketball, there's been a tremendous development. And because of the large population in China, you know, they really do have an opportunity to, you know, have a tremendous influence in the sport. That's amazing. Like you said, 300 yeah. uh, million people uh, introduced to that sport. And I think what we're also going to see is we're going to see China has a lot of great mountains in the north that we, we just haven't heard. And once you start building these resorts, once you start building these facilities, you know, you know, who knows? I mean, this could have a, a tremendous impact on China, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, China might be one of the best skiing destinations in Asia. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said at the right at the start of the interview, the in investment into infrastructure, so the high speed rail link that has gone into Yangqing, I believe is the pronunciation, I may be wrong, and the other uh, winter sports area that's outside of Beijing, uh, it's absolutely going to do wonders for, for those small towns and communities. And I'm excited to see what winter sports look like in China in 20 years time, because it could be one of the top destinations on the planet for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Benjamin, I want to thank you so much for coming on Real Talk China. I, I'm definitely going to be following your story and rooting for your success. Tell everybody, you know, where can we find out more information about you? Where, where can we follow your journey to Beijing? Yeah, it's super simple. If you just put Benji.ski, B-E-N-J-I dot S-K-I, either into Instagram or into your web browser, and you'll get to my Instagram page on my website. Super simple. And I'm, I'm pretty good at keeping it updated. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I'll put the links down in the description below for everybody. So Benjamin, um, I want to just wish you all the best. Thank you for coming on Real Talk China. Thanks for sharing your story with the world. And all of us are going to be rooting for your success. And uh, who knows, hopefully I can I can also come to Beijing and, and maybe there's a chance I can see you on those ski slopes. I would love to be uh, cheering for you in person. That would be amazing. I, I hope so too. I really hope so. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thanks, Benjamin.